Hi, this is Nathan Pierce from the F5 Network's Programmability and Orchestration Team. So this is episode 3 of the iWorkflow 201 series. So we are using REST calls to communicate with iWorkflow's service catalog and to deploy layer 4 to 7 application services onto F5's application delivery controllers. So in the previous episodes we've been using Postman which is a Chrome browser app that is a very nice REST client but now this episode we're going to move on to actually making REST calls from popular scripting languages JavaScript and Python. So we're still communicating in from the left hand side. Now this moving on to scripts is a common enabler for the transition from just executing automation off of a, a computer or a laptop and moving over to orchestration systems where these can execute the scripts programmatically themselves. So this will be interesting episode for you I hope. Now a little tip for those who are not familiar with scripting and don't know where to start um, I know I keep going on about Postman it does have some pretty cool tricks though but something we haven't done so far is looked at this generate code button so I've got a collection here I've opened this is the one we used in the last episode where we deployed a template via rest you may recall this if you looked at episode two of the 201 series so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to generate code and here we go you'll notice that was python i can now also look at node even using curl on the command line it automatically generates the code for you. Now it might not be exactly what you're looking for at the end, but it's really handy. It's an excellent starting point. So so what we've done um, to get the ball rolling here, I've taken, this is exactly the transaction we used before. Um, you can see it in the background. We're using variables, etc. It's got the body, which is user one admin tmos. If I now go back to generate code, you'll notice in var options, it's all very familiar. The method, the host it's going to, the URI for the resource we're going to communicate with, and then the headers. It's JSON payload and no cache. So we then scroll to the bottom. You'll notice here's the payload request write, username, user one, password admin, login provider, TMOS. So these are all the same things we've been working with. And then a bit of JavaScript in the middle is to handle the sending of the transaction and the processing of the results that come back. So starting from there, definitely use this as a starting point if you're not already a, a scripter. What I'm going to do though is I've been using Atom. If you're curious, I use Atom because it integrates well uh, nicely with the GitHub desktop client. That's the way that I'm sharing all of these via GitHub. I make my edits here and just sync them straight up into GitHub. Um, so you'll notice that this list here is grown a little bit from just some Python, sorry, from some uh, Postman collections here. We've got some JavaScript scripts and some Python scripts. And if I jump in my browser, you'll see here's the same list synced up with my laptop. So we'll go straight to the request an auth token script. Now, this is quite similar to the one we just looked at in Python, um, coming back to this list. But it's a little longer. I've added a few things in to make things easier. Now, if you've read the article already before you've watched this video, you'll understand what I'm about to say. The things I've added in are this one, so this line at the top, I'm using self-signed certificates. So Node, the runtime that I'm running JavaScript on, rightly so, it doesn't trust self-signed certificates. These aren't trusted certificates. So I put this line in here to tell it to not care if it's a self-signed certificate. Otherwise, it just throws out an error. So it's good that Node does that. Python, the, the Python runtime also does the same thing. It complains. We have a different command we use in Python to ignore it. But anyway, that's, that's the first line. This bit I also added in so that you don't have to manually type in the host name every time you want to edit the script and you don't have to manually type in the username and password. You'll see down here, username, it's taking an argument off the command line and password. It's taking, oops, 
it's taking an argument off the command line. Whereas if we go into Postman, it's hard coded those in based on the transaction that was set. Now, the reason we don't want to do that is, well, it's not very automated if you have to edit the script every time you run it. You might as well have just been using Postman the whole time. But I'll show you what I mean, why we have these arguments we've added in. So if I go out now to a command prompt, and we are just going to run node JavaScript request auth token. First thing, if I do it wrong, it actually tells me what it requires to run. It needs hostname, username, and password. Well, that's what this line is. It said if there is less than three arguments, I've made a mistake, so just print this out and exit. Well, that's useful, and it tells me what they are. So I need the host. In our case, it's 10. 128.1.130, same environment we've been using every week. Um, then I also need my username. User1 is the only non-administrative user we have in this box, and the password for that one is admin. So I can perform that transaction. Now, it doesn't make it format as pretty as what it did on Postman, but it is exactly the same data. In fact, there it is. That's my token. Now, I can use that token to step on and perform other transactions. For example, modify auth token timeout. Oops, spell helps if I type properly. It requires host token timeout. Again, 10.128.1.130. The token I just copied out of the previous one. And let's just pick a random number today. 2,900. You can see the default is 1,200 in the timeout. Um, oops, I didn't mean to click that. Now we're going to make it 2,900. And there's the new timeout, 2,900. So... It's handy to be able to use this um, to pass them in as variables. You can then do all sorts of things with your script, like you can actually just pick out certain elements. You don't have to print the entire payload like I have here, but um, the fact that I can call these as scripts now from a command line, you as an administrator can start being a little more programmatic in how you deploy things. You could deploy a template. I'll show you that in the next episode with a couple more tips and tricks and, and tunings we can do to the script. But um, what it means is once you're familiar with calling things in this method, whether it's JavaScript or Python or even a different language, it's then a very simple step to move from here to making these same requests from an orchestration system, a third party tool. So um, this level of simplification and abstraction really, really simplifies that next step. So it'd be wrong if I didn't also show how to do this in Python. So let's go to uh, Python request auth token. Same thing again, it spits out because I didn't give it enough arguments host, and then user1, admin. Same thing. Now with Python, let's go and look at the Python script I just executed. Request auth token. Python's formatted a little differently. Um, so here's how we check. Slightly different command, not exactly the same. But in Python, when we tell it to ignore the certificate, we do it by adding this into the request verify equals false. Now by adding that, uh, in Python, JavaScript just silently handles it. In Python, it still tells you this error. So it lets you know, okay, I am gonna ignore the fact that it's a self-signed cert, but I don't like it. Um, so yeah, here we go. That's, uh, but then after that, you notice the payload, again, is exactly the same. So there we go, that's the Python equivalent. I'm not gonna run through all of the scripts today. Um, we have them all here that do the same things as the JavaScript version, even listing the service templates that are available. In fact, we can list the service templates. Um, we'll do the Python example, given a Just went through this, you'll notice this one only requires the host and the token. Now this is important. We're not posting anything, we're not sending anything 
to the iWorkflow. We're merely doing a get. The other two transactions used a post and a patch, which both have a payload that you have to send. So we had to send it um, the timeout value, uh, for example, or we had to send it the username and password so that we could get the token in the first place. Well, now that we have the token, we're not actually going to send anything to it. We're just doing a, a normal HTTP GET request. And then I'll paste the token. Then I grabbed out the previous transaction and off we go. Um, and there it is, our service template. Fortunately, we just have the one in this, so it's not too long. Um, and this is exactly the f5.http service type A, the same one we deployed via Postman in our previous exercise. In fact, there it is here. If we look at the Postman version, exact same thing. So we're using the same REST API. Um, we did it via this nice GUI in Postman. Now we're starting to do the same transactions via JavaScript and Python. You can use other languages as well, as long as they can perform a REST call to the iWorkflow platform. That is all you really need. Uh, next episode, what we're going to do is actually do some deployments of some layer 4 to 7 application services. And I'm also going to even further simplify um, beyond just using command line options, we're going to start using constructors to um, set your environment variables once and then call all the individual scripts um, without having to reset the environment variables every time. So we'll have a look at that. That'll save you a bit more time again. So a short video this week, um, as I already stated, posting all of these things on GitHub. I'll put a link within the article once it's finished and uploaded. Thanks for listening. This has been Nathan Pierce from F5 Networks Programmability and Orchestration Team.